Good evening. Today is Tuesday, December 8th, 2020. I'm Heather Peffley, Clerk for the City of Manistee. The City Council's December 8th, 2020 work session being conducted remotely where all members of the City Council are in separate locations and not at the City Hall Council Chambers will be called to order by Mayor Roger Zielinski shortly. As always, this work session is being recorded and will be broadcast on Manistee TV cable channels 189 and 190 and available at manisteetv.org. City Council and City staff will have video and audio available for this work session. Members of the public will be audio only. The microphones of all members of the City Council, the City Manager, and the City Clerk will always be live unless there's an audio disruption. Mayor Zielinski, we are ready to proceed with the work session. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. We'll call the work session to order. Public comments on work session related items. Each person in the virtual waiting room will be called individually by the city clerk by the last four digits of their telephone number. Individuals will be asked if they have a comment or if they are passing. It is very important that those giving comments have good phone connection and no sound or noise in the background. Otherwise, there will be a disruptive audio. If this issue cannot be corrected by the caller, we'll move on to the next person in line. For those who don't have an agenda, <clears throat> excuse me, the discussion topics this evening are presentation of a Lakeshore Motel property, discussion on short-term rentals, discussion on updating sign ordinance, and a discussion on the deer cult. We'll now pay, take public comments and a reminder, please state your name and address prior to your comments and limit your comments to five minutes. Heather? Okay, give me one second. I'm still admitting people to the meetings. So we have a lot of people joining us this evening, so this may take a little bit. When I ask, I will be asking to unmute you. You'll need to press uh, star three if you're calling in. And I'm going to start with telephone number ending in 6203. Telephone number ending in 6203. Press star six if you're calling in to unmute. Yes, uh, thank you for this opportunity to you know, be with you. Please state uh, your name and address. Yes, this is Jen Teller from 712 Harbor Drive. And I just had a comment. Um, I'm in support of keeping the number of short-term rentals in the city at the same number currently. Uh, people want options to being in close contact on their vacations during these COVID-19 days and months that we've been going through. These people bring the vacation dollars that support downtown businesses, restaurants, and breweries, rentals of all kinds. They support a whole host of house cleaning and maintenance jobs that later disappear as we roll into the fall. So I'd just like to suggest that whoever is working on this, this uh, proposal for short-term rentals to be careful not to drive people from the area by having too strict of a policy Vacationers will spend their money elsewhere when options diminish for them to be with their families and, and not in hotels or motels. Even campgrounds don't offer the same kind of spacing that people are looking for. And yes, some people have had issues, but to throw out the baby with the bathwater it doesn't seem like, a, like fairness either. So I hope you'll take these comments into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Suzanne, do you have a comment? Suzanne, do you have a comment? 
Press star six if you're calling in to unmute. Do you have a comment or would you like to pass? Are you there? Okay, I'm going to pass and we'll go on. I'll try to come back to you if needed. Okay, I lost somebody. Telephone number 4175. Do you have a comment? Good evening, Heather. Good evening, council members. This is Mark Miller, Economic Development Director for the Manistee Area Chamber of Commerce. Um, I would like to read a statement from our Chamber President, Stacy Beitwork, who's unable to attend tonight's meeting. Uh, she asked me to deliver the following short statement on uh, short-term rentals uh, here in Manistee. Uh, the statement goes as follows. Questions about what is appropriate for our community are surely difficult. According to the M MEDC, the overall visitor and tourism spending for 2018 is $153 million in the Manistee area. Tourism's impact on our economy is important and the overall financial well-being of our homeowners and residents, as well as the ability to reinvest money into our fantastic homes, uh, is dependent on visitors finding their preferred options for their visit and having great experiences in Manistee. Short-term rentals will surely play a strong role in our prosperity moving forward and the visitor's experience of living the Manistee lifestyle, albeit for a short visit, will be in our long-term interest. Uh, that is the end of the statement from Stacy. And we also are very uh, encouraged to have the Lakeshore uh, property project uh, on tonight's agenda. Uh, it's very exciting to see that and we look forward to uh, progress on that project. We've been working very hard with the city on that one. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. And good night. Thanks, Heather. Yep. Telephone number ending in one six one six one nine. I do not have a comment. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Telephone number 1299, do you have a comment? Uh, no comment, thank you. Thank you. Telephone number 2012, do you have a comment? Telephone number ending in 2012. Do you have a comment? No comment. Was that no? no. Okay, thank you. I have Corey L. Do you have a comment? Yes, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Corey Lupinacci. Uh, my address in Manistee is 318 Lakeshore Drive. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to present some comments concerning the development of a short-term rental ordinance for the city of Manistee. As mentioned in my previous correspondence to the Manistee Planning Commission, our property is used primarily as our family's vacation home. Our short-term vacation rentals are secondary to our family's personal usage which takes place throughout the year. In reviewing the recent coverage about the process that's underway, it's been mentioned that the ordinance might provide different treatment for condominium properties. I would like to offer comments in support of that. Our condominium association's bylaws state the fundamental guidelines that must be followed for co-owners to rent their units. These include that no rentals are allowed until title has been held for two years. This was intended to reduce instances 
where investors would purchase units solely for rental activity. Also, renters are, rentals are for a minimum seven-night duration. This was intended to reduce the transient nature that might exist within rental activity. Our board of directors, of which I am a member, have subsequently developed and implemented a list of rental rules. These rules clearly state our association's expectations regarding the acceptable behaviors by renters. These include provisions on occupancy limits, parking, trash, and other activities. The rental rules are incorporated by reference in all rental agreements. Our condominium association management company has the contact details both for my rental manager and also for me. Renters are made aware in advance that the rules will be strictly enforced by our rental manager and that violators can be subject to eviction without refund. As a result, we have had no problems and also we have had no complaints. From a personal standpoint, I would like to add that we have participated in the rental inspection program for the entire duration of our rental activity and we fully support the continuation of this requirement. That said, we do not believe that any other license fees are justified, only those associated with the recovery of the city's costs. Finally, I recommend that condominium properties should be excluded from any potential limits on rental units in other, dis rental units in other districts. This is because our properties are markedly different than other types of residences and would not be a low cost alternative for people seeking to find a rental home. If the council would like copies of anything I have described, I would be happy to provide them. Otherwise, I thank you once again for your time. Thank you. Peter, last initial of B as in boy, do you have a comment? This is uh, Peter Buchla in town Welling. We are here okay. at the Lakeshore Hotel Roger. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Telephone number ending in 8616. Do you have a comment? Eight six one six. Hi, this is Pamela Weiner, four ten Pine Street, and I'm very interested in what the council has to say about the short-term rentals and the uh, sign ordinances. But I'm also very interested to hear about the plans for the Lakeshore Hotel. Thank you. Thank you. Telephone number 2486, do you have a comment? Two four eight six. do you have a comment? Telephone number 5882, do you have a comment? Five eight eight two. do you have a comment? Telephone number 8035, do you have a comment? Please be sure to press star six to unmute yourself. I 
I just had somebody else come in. Hold on one second. Telephone number 9983. Do you have a comment? No, I do not. Thank you. Last name of Lloyd. Do you have a comment? No comment. Thank you. Shane B, do you have a comment? No comment. Thomas T, do you have a comment? Um, I'm an architect with the Gafari Associates here with the uh, Lakeshore Development Project. No comment. Okay. Thank you. We're getting there. Oh. Sorry, I already got you. Um, if there's somebody I have missed, oh, I can see one here. Uh, 5130, do you have a comment? Telephone number 5130, do you have a comment? No comment. Okay, thank you. I think I have one more. And I think they hung up. If I missed anybody, please press star six and state your name and address. Hearing none, Mayor, we are ready. Thank you, Heather. We'll move on to the presentation of the Lakeshore Motel property. I'm not sure who's gonna be leading that. This is Peter, I'm on Tom's computer right now. I can, uh lead that. I have a little presentation if I could share my screen. Sure. Yes. Let me get, um, you should have capability to do that. Says, says host has disabled it. Um, let's see. Let's try that. Oh, there we go. Excellent. Not seeing it yet. Uh, right there. Are you seeing that? It's coming. Yep, there we go. Excellent. Well, I'm under Tom's name. Tom's sitting right here to my right. Uh, and uh, We'll be trading seats here in a minute uh, to walk you through this project. So. Um, <clears throat> first off, I'd like to uh, say thanks to uh, Thad, uh, Jeff at the um, at, uh, Department of Public Works, um, as well as Mark and Stacy at the Chamber have all been really great to work through, as well as everybody else in the community. It's uh, very refreshing to work with a community that is um, open to ideas and willing to help solve a problem. Uh, just know that they've had the community in mind this whole time. So um, yeah, so thank you to them for their help thus far in the project. I am, let's see if I can, oh, maybe I just. So my name is Peter Bukema. I am the CEO and visionary for Suburban Ends. Uh, my parents started Suburban Ends back in 1979 when they bought a 35 room motel up in the UP. Um, my brothers and I all grew up behind the front desk of that property. Today, I uh, run the family business. Uh, we build, design, and manage hotels and restaurants all in Michigan. Um, most of our properties are in Holland and Grand Rapids, and we do have a property over in Midland as well. Um, we are, oh, sorry, Tom's guiding me here. Um, so, We've been working with Gafari and Associates on this project along with Pioneer Construction. Some of you may know Scotty Veen. He's a uh, Manistee alumni. I think he's dialed in with us tonight. Um, all have been great to work with thus far on the project. So 
um, from a 30,000 foot level of what we're working on here, um, it would be a, a Hilton branded hotel, um, part of the Hilton family of brands, I should say. Uh, it's 108 room properties the way it's laying out today. Um, it would be five stories tall. Uh, it would feature an indoor pool with an indoor outdoor hot tub, which is a signature element of our properties that we've been doing for the last uh, Know, probably 20 years or so in our properties, an indoor fitness center, um, a lobby bar slash beach bar with fire pits uh, overlooking Lake Michigan and the gorgeous dune there. So, and I'll step to the side and I'll let Tom slide in here to walk you through a little bit more of the vision and the plan. So I too would like to echo Pete's comments. Uh, I've been doing this for uh, 25 years and uh, I've really never received a welcome like we've had so far in Manistee. So it's just been a great experience. Um, what you see now is a rendering of the site plan. So the, the existing uh, motel uh, sits approximately where the, the what you're seeing there, uh, maybe a little closer to the water, um, but Essentially, what we're looking at is something that would be located very similar to where it is now. Um, as Pete mentioned, it's, uh, this would be a branded hotel. So this is a five-story Hampton Inn and Suites. Um, it would feature balconies um, on both sides. So this would be the, the back side or the east side of the, of the hotel. And this would be the west side. So. As Pete mentioned, there's an indoor pool with an indoor outdoor spa. So that's located down here in this corner. Uh, the fitness center would be along the front here. And then out on this patio would be the lobby uh, bar, which would be an indoor outdoor bar with some fire pits out there so we could extend the season somewhat. Um, just to give you an idea what the floor plan would look like. <clears throat> so I mentioned down in the lower left corner would be the hot tub. So there's a little swim through. Um, this is very popular in the winter. Um, with indoor pool, the fitness center, uh, the main lobby, back of house offices, kind of a loungy area here. So as you enter in from the parking lot, you'll be able to look straight through out to the lake. Um, this area here is used in the morning for breakfast. So with the Hampton Inns, you get uh, complimentary breakfast. And then in the evening, it would be used as the hotel lobby bar, um, laundry, uh, breakfast area, and then primarily back of house type uh, services. Then out in front of the hotel, we would see something like a bocce cord or some, some bags. And then um, the, the patio with a walkway that would extend out to uh, Lakeshore Drive. What the second through fifth floor uh, are your standard rooms that run from uh, King, King Junior Suites to Double Queens. So pretty typical Hampton Inn style rooms. And again, uh, these would all have balconies with a couple chairs and a table. So uh, a great place to sit at night. So we talked about working with the city. So um, there's no way that we can obviously do this together. So some of the things that, uh, that we'll be working on together and, and have been working on so far is um, the property is currently zoned residential, I believe. So it would take a PUD to, uh, to make this work. Um, so the way it's planned right now, we're short approximately 20 to 25 parking spaces that we can get on the site. So we've been working with, uh, with the city and, a, and a city engineering, the possibility to add some parking along Lakeshore Drive here. Um, so uh, the addition of, of these parking spaces would provide additional parking down in this area that doesn't currently exist 
that could also be used for some of our offsite parking. Um, in addition to parking, offsite stormwater detention uh, is a challenge. So once again, <clears throat> working with the city engineering and Department of Public Works, there's um, some flooding issues that occur down in this area here typically. So what's proposed is the possibility of creating this uh, detention area here and uh, tying that into this uh, catch basin over here to solve this flooding area and then also to take storm water off from the site. So kind of kind of solving a couple of problems at the, uh, at the same time. Um, in addition, there's uh, the water main that comes down to the site and ends right here is sufficient to provide water um, and fire suppression to the hotel. However, it's not sufficient to provide a second connection for the fire department. So <clears throat> again, working with uh, Jeff at the Department of Public Works and uh, Sean with City Engineering, we're looking at the, the possibility of uh, creating a loop from the end of this water main up to this neighborhood where this water main ends. Um, that would provide uh, the opportunity for a second connection for the fire department, but also solves a problem in this neighborhood that this water main is essentially a dead end and uh, requires routine flushing of that water main because it is a dead end. So, um, <clears throat> so again, we're looking at this as a possibility and uh, working with the city on how to solve that problem. Um, a few other things that we'll be working on is the brownfield credits. Um, and the hotel lobby bar, um, we're gonna ask that that be considered a hotel amenity versus a standalone restaurant. It really is not that, it is truly a hotel uh, amenity. Um, and the reason for that is if it's considered a standalone restaurant that drives the parking requirements up significantly higher. And we don't anticipate a lot of exterior guests uh, there. It, it's primarily for the, the hotel guests, although there will be uh, clearly some walk-ups, but um, we have this in, in our Hampton and in Holland, and that's really based on experience what we see. Um, like with any PUD, we'll need a signage package. So there's signs on the building, you know, the parking lot directional signage and a monument sign. Some of these are requirements by the brand of the franchise. Um, I'm gonna flip this back to, to Pete, but before I do, I don't know if there's any questions on, on the building itself, but uh, we can take those at the end. So again, thanks for having us. Uh, it's been uh, a great experience so far. So back to Pete. Excellent. So, you know, one thing I was a little remiss on too when I was doing my intro is talking about our management company. So we um, pride ourselves in our product and our engagement within the community. All of our properties are ranked in the top 15% of the respective brands. Um, the brands that we own and operate, uh, most recently, the City Flats, downtown Holland, Michigan, we added that to the portfolio, the Courtyard Marriott, downtown Holland, the Hampton and the Holiday Inn Express in Holland. Um, the la about a year and a half, uh, we're push pushing almost two years now, the Embassy Suites, downtown Grand Rapids, Hilton Garden in Grand Rapids, which is over by the Woodland Mall, and then the Holiday Inn Midland are our properties. So um, all of them are, you know, we run high quality hotels. Um, there, I know there were some comments early on about, oh, this is only a Hampton Inn. Our Hampton Inn though in Holland is a prime example. It, the quality level and the finishes are far superior to your standard Hampton Inn. Um, the reason for the Hampton Inn brand really in our mind is it is kind of that uh, pillar of the hospitality community that is attractive to um, all demographics, all walks of life. Uh, corporate and leisure travelers find value in it. And uh, 
at this point, you'd have to travel about 90 miles in any general direction to find um, the next uh, Hilton product. So that's kind of how we landed on that as a brand. Um, but we don't, we don't look at uh, like short-term rentals. To us, that's a piece of the market. Um, and each brand and each um, segment provides something for the market. And so, yes, we're all at some level of competition, but we're really fishing for different fish, um, even if we're in the same pond. So, um, you know, I think we all play a vital piece of this. And uh, yeah, so um, a little bit about the potential impact um, from an economic standpoint. Um, the property should bring approximately $4 million worth of economic development into the community through the spend by the guests of the property. Um, it'll create 35 new jobs. The uh, hourly wages will range between $11 and $17 an hour and higher with our management team. Um, it'll generate new property taxes. Um, it'll have a, it, uh, obviously uh, a, a lot of additional visitors to the Manistee area uh, throughout the summer and hopefully the fall and winter months as well. Um, and that's the end of that. Here's a, a list of a lot of the brands that we own and operate as, a, as an organization. So again, uh, Tom's here, uh, Thule from uh, Grafari. Um, I believe Scott's on the line too from Pioneer if there was any questions on that front, but Tom Welling on our team can help field any questions that, uh, that anybody may have. Any uh, council members, do you have any questions? Yeah, this is uh, Mick Shemansky. Um, this uh, five-story property, will it uh, be um, below the tree cover that is currently on that parcel of land. It's going to be right at the same height. Tom actually went and measured those trees himself. Uh, I believe those trees were right around 65 feet tall. Um, and I believe the top of the building is right about that same height as it sits today. Muted. So in other words, it's not going to be impacting the view uh, for anyone currently uh, in that general area? Correct. And that's, that was the reason why we felt comfortable um, going to that fifth story. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? I have a question. Um, I'm, I'm not opposed to this project. <clears throat> My only concern is the signage, like the neon signs on every side of the building, and then the floodlights that you need for like the parking parking lot. So the people that live behind there, like the condos and Harbor Drive, when they look towards the lake shore, I mean, they're still the trees are still going to be kind of covering the building, but you're going to have this huge neon sign that's going to completely change the shoreline view out there. Like how big are the neon, I mean, they gotta be pretty standard since you're a chain. So they're channel lit letters. So yes, they, I mean, they do emit light. Um, it's not necessarily Vegas-esque. Uh, so I don't wanna say, you know, neon per se, like super bright. Um, right off the top of my head though, I'm not sure the size for the band, standard. it's pretty standard. Um, I can try to get more like lumen output and information on that front. Um, on the parking lot, the physical parking lot lights itself, you know, we'll do our best. And, and I think lights have come a long ways too to help cascade the light down and in, in, into the designated parking lot to prevent kind of light pollution, if you will, I guess, for a lack of better terms. Um, but yes, we can work with the city on that and uh, really focus on what that impact will be to the community from uh, but you but you can't that. change it too much, right? Because it is a chain, it is a brand. It has to be right. They're sign <clears throat> all of the major brands are really good about here you go. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, okay. Um, we can ask for variances, but 
that comes usually well, with my only issue is for the people that you know almost everybody that has enjoyed going down there you round the corner and you got a big hilton sign staring yeah. at you and i think that we kind of pride ourselves that we in holland and you know related with all you know hotels and stores and, and stuff like that mm -hmm. so could, that, that's we... that's my yeah, we can provide some uh, more examples. I, I I don't think it's going to be as big of an issue um, or, or, you know, I think it'll blend in well, I guess is probably what I should say. Signage wise on the monument sign on the road, we would be looking for a similar size to what is there now uh, with the Lakeshore. Um, and the Hampton and monument sign is not a very bright sign. I would I would agree that the the channel letters up on the building are a little brighter in my opinion, um, mainly red versus blue at night. Um, but we could definitely take a look at that and bring that back to the uh, the board and the group to review. Okay. Anybody else have any questions, comments, concerns? Yes. Yes, I have a question. Uh, being unable to see the plan, you mentioned about a, a detention basin. I'm sorry, this is this for is... council discussion only, ma'am. Oh, sorry. Your oh, Honor, I Roger, have a... I have a couple questions. Oops, sorry, Jeff. No, go ahead. Okay. Um, I just could not tell by the overviews how close this was to the uh, playground. Uh, and I have some concerns about how close it might be. Um, I'm also a little concerned about any loss of parking spaces for our public. Uh, we only have, we have two public beaches and uh, obviously this is gonna add a lot of traffic to our public beach that we have and we'll have to do a lot of, a lot, I'm hoping we don't have to do a lot of extra cleaning up after people, but I'll leave that to Jeff to kind of guide us on that. I, I just, those are my concerns. I'm also, I find it interesting as this is a PUD, are you, I'm going to assume you're not asking us for any financial considerations in the way of a pilot. And please correct me if I'm right or wrong on that. So our, um, here I'm, I lost you here when I was, or the screen when I was, oh, there we go. When I was pulling up, can you see the site plan right now by chance? Not yet. Okay. Hasn't come back yet. Okay. Um, here, I will share that a second while I'm talking and share just for conversation. Um, so on the traffic count, um, our need is mainly going to be for overnight. Our guests typically uh, arrive between four and nine o'clock at night and they start to leave at about four or five in the morning, depending on their destination. And they filter out through about nine o'clock in the morning. Um, so during the high time at the beach, we would actually have a lot of parking available that we would be more than willing to allow beachgoers to utilize as well. Um, the, the guests of ours that would need that parking would be arriving later at night um, when the lot's full. With this property, uh, we anticipated being a lot of families, so a lot of double occupancy, so uh, one car, two rooms. Um, so our hope is that it's the actual use of those additional spots is very minimal. Um, the playground, it's kind of hard to tell. I was hoping this would depict maybe that a little bit better. It's close. Yeah, the parking lot's kind of is kind of close to it. That the the garage uh, that's at the Lakeshore Motel is somewhere in this area right now on the site. Um, the drive lane coming in is pretty close to what is there today, if I recall correctly, how that site laid out. Hey Pete, if I may, mm -hmm. Scotty, um, I know this property very well. the The current site plan that Pete has up. Uh, actually doesn't take down the tree line between Rocket Park and the physical site that's shown here on, that's depicted. So um, there is a barrier between uh, this property and Rocket Park. 
Okay, that's so, good, good to know. This is Jeff McCulla. If you showed your the next slide in your presentation with the stormwater, that may show that a little bit better. Yeah, it would. Yep. Is it the other way? Yeah, it is. Isn't it? Did I get there? Nope, not yet. Oh, it's way. Oh, I was saying, I thought it was towards the end. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> And again, the, the basketball courts, um, the dog park, uh, that's still being protected by the trees, the tree line as well to the east. Oh, show, I guess. There you go. There. <clears throat> so the park, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, is mainly in this area and then up over here. Or, uh, I guess you probably can't really see my mouse, can you? Yeah, I, I think it would be important on this, yeah, on that image right there to show where the property line is. There's a very large tree canopy within the park that surrounds uh, the Lakeshore Hotel property, which provides a lot of separation. It also provides vegetative uh, cover, and it's really the tree canopy uh, that was described earlier uh, that really protects the I, I believe will protect views from the the south and from the uh, east. The Lakeshore Motel, too, I believe, Jeff, it, it is literally almost right on the property line. Um, in the parking lot, as you can see there to the south of that line, is, <clears throat> is, is I think, actually over the line that it sits today a little bit. Correct. Hey, Pete, this is Chris Beckering here. I'm with Pioneer Construction, for those who don't know me. I think if you go back one slide or maybe two slides, there's another aerial that there, right there. Stop there for just a minute, if you would. So uh, this property shows what Scotty was talking about in terms of there being that the significant portion of that natural tree canopy that exists today is actually on park property. So the, the property line, if you see where that like blue square is, uh, up at the north end right there. Mm -hmm. If you go due south from that, that's an approximation where that property line is, but it does angle back this way, you know, toward the beach. So as it's coming back in, you can see all those bushy trees where it says 20 minus 10 equals 10 there, just to the left of those, all those big trees there are not on the property that we're talking about. Those are on the park property. Okay. Thank and you. would not be and would not be impacted. And the pilot, are you asking for a pilot? Are you asking for any financial incentives? The only incentives that we are working on would be through the MEPC and would be economic development stuff for uh, there's um, some brownfield with uh, the lead based paint and asbestos in the building. Um, a few of those types of credits. It wouldn't be anything um, abnormal for a normal MEDC type request of the city. Okay. <clears throat> That's it, thank you. Anybody else? Your Honor, this is uh, Jeff McCullough, if I could make a few comments. Yes. So, uh, as the development team has described, we've been uh, working with this group for uh, several months. And I wanted to point out when, when they discussed some of the things that they needed and you know, in cooperation with the city, each one of those items, uh, specifically parking, stormwater, and uh, fire suppression, those items, were discussed and each one of them has a significant city impact, uh, has a significant positive city impact. The parking, and, and I don't think it was mentioned, but there's discussion about using um, or putting a curb cut on First Street and allowing overflow parking to occur in the large parking lot. <laughs> 
And the screen that's up right now where you see the hatching actually shows the potential to build permanent parking spaces by the development and allowing that as an offset to the temporary uh, spaces that could be utilized in the large parking lot. What that does is, is it brings current public parking for the use of the hotel that's very adjacent to them um, and doesn't have an impact on our daily usage, but it potentially also expands the number of permanent parking spaces within the park that can be utilized year round uh, by all of our visitors. The stormwater, uh, we've got some flooding issues uh, within that park and we've contemplated how to fix those flooding issues um, and just really haven't had the um, the financing to and to prior and be, to be able to prioritize that as a solution, where <laughs> the retention pond uh, that that was just or that was shown can solve some city issues, but also provide um, some solution that the development needs. The alternative, some of the alternatives to that would be to tie into our current stormwater system. Um, which wasn't sized for the development, but could impact the street system or uh, tie into the system that, that currently drains the large parking lot to the north, which discharges down at the, uh, at the First Street Pier. And um, I think this has far, far less impact on, um, on the park itself um, than any of the other options. And when we say pond, it's not gonna be a flooded area where there's standing water in it. It simply drains water into a depression in the sand which infiltrates into the ground. Um, and the reason why we're showing that uh, so large based on the engineer's calculations is to make sure that it's not a standing water type of situation because we don't wanna bring a hazard into the park. The water main, um, I want to describe that a little bit a little bit further. Currently at Harbor Drive, there's a six inch water main that runs all the way from Cherry Street to the west end of Harbor Drive. And that has a potential negative water quality impacts. And as was described earlier, um, our water department has to flush that numerous times throughout the year to make sure that we've got fresh water and, um, and that those residents are being served by that. But also uh, dead ends in a water system are, uh, tr we try to avoid those at all costs. And sometimes they're just, they're not avoidable. Um, and in this one, the length of that line and the size of that line creates um, a reduction in what's, what's available for fire suppression. So it doesn't meet the current standards of what we'd like to see for fire suppression in the community. And by adding that loop, um, it has direct benefit to in substantially increasing the fire suppression, not just for the hotel, but for all the residents on Harbor Drive. And it also improves, improves the water quality there. So the, the, work, the things that I've been dealing with on this, uh, we've had, uh, pretty much win-wins on both sides. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that council was aware that, um, you know, we've been working in a very positive manner with the group. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Uh, I just have one more question. Um, is there a reason that it needs to be five stories? Really for the the business case of the project um, to get over that 100 room mark um, and then still have the amenities in the hotel that we would like to offer the indoor outdoor pool and hot tub um, or hot tub and then the indoor pool uh, along with the, the lobby uh, bar. Um, <clears throat> it really eats up a lot of that ground floor space. And the site is a very small site. It's uh, two acres, almost right on the right on the dot. And really, for a property 
of this size to, to keep it under five stories, we'd need about two and a half to three acres of land. Um, so we're trying to just fit all of the, um, the parts and the pieces on the same, uh, on the site and, and make it, make it work for the business case. Okay. Anybody else with any questions? Tom, you, you mentioned how, how, how much, it, how you enjoyed working with the city of Manistee. I have heard the other side of this too, that the city of Manistee has really enjoyed working with you. Um, you've been very cooperative and very um, positive in moving forward. Uh, do you have any questions for us, Tom? Do you? Uh, I would say Tom, yeah. Tom does about 80% of the working with the city. This oh, is Pete. Sorry. Miller. That, I, uh, that's okay. On the screen. The, yeah, yeah, that's okay. So, yeah. So I'm Tom and Pete's my boss. So, sorry. Um, no, at this point, I, you know, I, I think we've, we've covered it. Um, you know, we're going, we're going through the, you know, the process now of the submissions and, and, and such. Um, but, um, yeah, just to reiterate, um, you know, I, I used to, uh, I, have a, I don't have the same ties to Manistee as Scotty Bean, but, um, but I spent my summers up in Onekama uh, in high school and spent a lot of time in Manistee. And so many years later, it's been, it's been great to come back and, and see the, the possibilities. So thank you. Tom and Pete, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. you nothing further, we'll, council, nothing further, we'll move on. Discussion on short-term rentals, city manager, Mr. Taylor. Yes, as council is aware, um, you directed staff to start working on an ordinance to regulate short-term rentals. I enlisted the help of the city attorney and uh, the Manistee County Planning Department, specifically Mike Sokola. And we've met, and before we start down the road of, an, of developing the ordinance language, we just wanted some time to discuss with council some ideas that we had to make sure that we were moving in the right direction. So one of the things um, that we thought should be in <clears throat> the ordinance is we need to ensure that they're, they're all included in the city's rental inspection program. Secondly, um, that they would be required to register as a business. We, we currently have a business registration fee for all businesses that operate in the city, that's a $75 cost. Uh, or we could establish a separate license and fee structure for short-term rentals. Uh, if we did that, we would just have to be able to justify uh, those costs for working uh, in, on the license. Um, we need to, uh, we think we need to, uh, establish some type of process that where we can revoke short-term rental registrations or licenses based on verifiable complaints or property appearance or similar issues. Um, also uh, allow condominium associ associations to determine if they wish to allow short-term rentals in their association. So basically just leave it to the condo associations. Um, we don't think it, it's appropriate to limit the number of short-term rentals in the commercial districts or the DDA district because they are viewed as a business. Uh, we would uh, suggest establishing a substantial fine for violation of the ordinance. And, uh, you know, I'm not prepared to quantify what a substantial fine is at this time, but we think it's gotta be substantial. Um, we think there's a need to limit the number of short-term rentals in the residential zoning districts, again, with the exception of condo association. Um, the biggest hurdle we, we anticipate is to determine the exact number of short-term rentals in the city. Um, you know, one option we could engage a company such as host compliance that will help us in determining the locations of all different types of uh, short-term rentals. Um, the, 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 that cost could be financed by the, the short-term rental, rental registration fees. 
another consideration is ask the uh, Manistee County Visitors Bureau to help with the cost because uh, they get uh, a certain percentage of each night's stay that goes to the uh, to their organization. And then, you know, if the if the number of short term rentals are considered too high, uh, resolve this resolve the number and get them down to the the number the council wishes through the sale of properties until uh, the desired number of <coughs> rentals is achieved. And that would be something along the lines. And I'm just throwing out numbers. If if we had a hundred in the residential unit areas, and the council only wanted 50, you know, when one was sold, they couldn't. That would be off the rental, uh, the uh, short-term rental list. And so, in that case, you know, it would be down to 99, and then just work it down. I don't think it's appropriate to just randomly decide who can and can't operate a short-term rental just to get to a, some kind of a number. Um, if, if, if the short-term rental is managed by a management company, make sure that they have a representative that lives in a certain radius of the city or can respond in a certain amount of time. And again, if the short-term rental is managed by the owner of the property, you know, require the owner live in a certain radius of the city or uh, if they don't meet that requirement, mandate that they hire a representative that can meet the requirements. So those are those are nine or plus different points that we thought not only did we hear in the previous discussion from council, but we as as staff thought it was appropriate to move um, into a into some kind of an ordinance. So I just want a little feedback from council. Uh, is staff walking the right way council uh, mr taylor um i i read what you had you put forward here and i think uh that's just about as close as is i think uh we could get to a reasonable ordinance in management and control uh when it comes to fees you know i i agree you know this shouldn't necessarily be a a, a an avenue to raise money for the city, but certainly we want to cover our costs. And I do agree that we probably want to have a company like Host Compliance or somebody similar to be able to help us in the management of this, because obviously there are so many factors involved, uh, just tracing who has rental companies, you know, with with all the different venues available to, for people to rent short-term rentals, um, I think it's probably above and beyond what we currently have as far as staff to be able to do that. So I, I think that our fees uh, need to be reasonable enough to make sure that you know it is not an extra cost to the city uh, that the short-term rental program pays for itself. But I think what you've presented here is fair and reasonable. It doesn't eliminate or, or necessarily even reduce uh, the amount of short-term rentals, but it does manage it for the future. And that has always been my concern is, is that we just can't let it become an uncontrolled process forever. And I think this does give us the tools to, to kind of move um, short-term rentals into a reasonable uh, process within the city. The only other thing is when we talk about short-term rentals and, and, and um, being able to um, manage properties, uh, why would we separate short-term rentals from long-term rentals as far as compliance? I think it would be just as important for us to be able to have a way of, of uh, addressing a long-term rental program or property that is not meeting the requirements as well as short-term. In, in council member, I, I don't disagree at all, um, but you know, this is obviously focused specifically on the short-term rentals and okay. maybe that's something that staff could look at for um, all other rentals. I have some comments. If I may go ahead now. Go ahead. This is Linda Beaton. Um, 
uh, along with uh, having unlimited uh, short-term rentals for being left up to the condo association, I really do think we have a small number of well-run uh, short-term rentals in the city where the host remains on site. And I don't have a problem with those. I think those should be unlimited as well. It gives the neighborhood a feeling of uh, security because their neighbor is the host. Um, so I would like some consideration or some thought process on that. Um, I've also been thinking how we could actually try to get some uh, people to just go ahead and make sure that they're in the, the rental program and go ahead and register and give them a discount for volunteering to register if they just provide us with a copy of their ad for the short-term rental that might actually be part of the application process. I, it's hard for me to figure out what the number of short-term rentals should be without knowing exactly where they all exist. So I totally agree with Mick on that. And, um, but I do think it's unfair to overly burden one side of the city against the other. So I see the river as a natural dividing point. If we get to figuring out what the number would be, I'd like it to be balanced between both sides of the river because in the summer, that's where we're going to see the majority of the short-term rental people coming into town and they're going to be using our beaches the same time our residents are. And that's all I have right now. Thank you for working on this, though. Thanks, appreciate that. Mr. Taylor, yes. do we have any idea, the prox approximate number or a close count of how many vacation rentals we have in the city? I don't, I've, I've asked Safe Built. In, in hopes that maybe uh, Safe Built or the predecessor Spicer was somehow tracking different types of rental units. They aren't. Uh, I've asked Safe Built going forward that they modify the, the rental registration form so we have a couple of options, you know, long term versus short term versus, you know, whatever. And so um, we have a, we have a, uh, an avenue going forward to start deciding what's what in terms of rentals in the community, but right now it doesn't exist. Do you think, is there a way that we can, we can find out? I, I find it hard to decide to make decisions when I don't, I don't know. I don't know if there's a hundred or if there's 200 or if there's 10. Well, I think we can go, we can go to the, the, the rental companies that exist now. That would be a, you know, some type of baseline that's the easy part of it. But then we're gonna need some help from a firm like Host Compliance to find those outliers that are kind of flying under the radar. Do we have a, an idea of the cost of, of that? Um, I think Mike had gotten some very ballpark figures and I, I thought it was between three and $5,000 a year to do that. I just think it's important that we that we come up with a pretty accurate number of what we have. Otherwise, how do we know moving forward the number that we need or the number we want, or even if we want a number? I, I agree, you know, and we've been pretty adamant that, that we need to know how many we have. And um, I think it's safe to say that that there are some outliers out there and um, we can, staff can put a little bit more time into getting a, a better idea of the cost to do an evaluation of our community to try to uh, determine how many short-term rentals there are. Uh, Council, how do you feel about having, uh, hiring somebody like Host to get an accurate count of the vacation rentals we have in the community? Mayor, if I may, Dave Bachman here, I think that um, they're on the right track with that. And I think hiring host to do that is an excellent opportunity. We also have to anticipate that our rental inspection people are going to be working a lot harder between this and the, and the upcoming blight discussion. We're going to put a lot on their plate and we probably need to be prepared for more costs if that's the case for doing that. But we can't, you can't always get things you want without paying for them. Oh. 
This is Mick Shemansky. Oh, I, I also think it's important that, that we recognize the fact that what we are doing shouldn't impact anybody who's already legitimately running a short-term rental program, regardless where they are in the city. We're not trying to take something away. So perhaps some kind of a grandfather clause, I think is important so that people recognize that what we're looking for is to, to put a handle on what's happening in the future but we don't want to impact people who've already made investments currently. Anybody else have any comments? I, I, want to I, I have, I've got quite a few comments. Um, so if we're going to include short-term rentals in the city's rental inspection program, <clears throat> you have to have the same regulations that I, I know that you, don't want to discuss long term, but it goes together. So you can't say for these short terms, you know, you require it to be registered, uh, the appearance and the property complaints, like if they have complaints and their property isn't kept up, they get their registration revoked. You can't have it for short term rentals and then turn around and not have it for term rentals. And if anybody bothered to ask the chief, I mean, they have not had complaints on short-term rentals. It's been the long-term rentals. So for, for us to put in all this work on short-term rentals and regulate this when we can't get our long-term rentals under control and cleaned up is just ridiculous to me. Like, are we going to completely ignore all the public comments that we've had about not putting a limit on short-term rentals just because we have to have an ordinance about this and just totally disregard the long-term rentals and the garbage that people are living in. I, I understand that it's a short-term rental topic, but it does not stop there. It, they go hand in hand with each other. And that's my frustration. Like you're telling, you know, if there's too many short-term rentals, you're going to have to sell a property. So we're under that or, you know, sell a property, then, you know, that number goes below, but then you're, you're just ignoring the long-term rentals. Like I, I, I cannot wrap my head around this. Anybody else? Yeah, I have a question. What is the, when you guys were talking about the Manistee County Visitors Bureau and the fees or the, that are paid from the short term, what was that about? They, they get a, a, a certain percentage for the occupancy of the occupancy rate, much like a motel or hotel, something like that. And so, you know, I, I would imagine that the, the, the short-term rentals that are that we're aware of and are managed by uh, management companies and are part of the rental inspection program, they're already paying that to the Convention and Visitors Bureau. I'm just pointing out that, you know, for every one that's flying under the radar, that could be possibly new revenue for the CVB. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? It's so ridiculous. Anybody else? I don't care. Hearing none, we'll move on to the next agenda item. Discussion on updating side ordinances or side ordinance. County interim planner, Mike. Good evening, everyone. Um, so much like the short-term rental ordinance, uh, um, we've been looking at a, at the planning commission, we've been looking at updating the sign ordinance. Um, it was kind of brought to my attention with the previous planner uh, that was in the position of, of administering the city that some of the definitions um, and some of the more modern uh, sign um, ordinances, the city was kind of lacking in theirs. Um, what we're looking for is a consensus to move forward on developing a sign ordinance because it was going to take significant staff time and also some direction as well. 
One of those being, um, would you guys like to see a dark skies sign ordinance? Um, much like you would see in like a Petoskey. Uh, would you like us to look at um, the International Sign Association with the um, international or the uh, American Planning Association and what they developed? Um, there's, there's just a little bit of direction we're looking for. Is there any areas of the city that you want us to concentrate on? Would you like to see an elimination of poll signs? Um, so we're just looking for a consensus first to move forward with some kind of development and then what you guys would like to see certain areas even of the city that you that you have grown to like and would like to um, you know replicate throughout the city or um, just something moving forward so uh, we know you know what you guys want so when we bring it back forward um, you know everybody's happy with it. Mike could you bring us up to speed on what issues you're having with the, the current sign ordinance? Uh, there's been some definitions that have that have been lacking uh, as far as um, uh, square footage on corners. We had to go to a ZBA for that to get an interpretation of it. Um, and there had been, uh, and, and this does happen when you have other people take over um, a sign ordinance that's been in, uh, you know, in the hands of uh, a certain people that either a wrote it or had a part in it, um, and then other people come in and try to interpret it it becomes very difficult if it's really not clear and concise writing or um, you know, it's, it's, it's not more standardized or something that you would look for. So there's just been a couple of issues where uh, we ran into sign issues throughout the city um, where we're just looking for either definitions, uh, you know, or to, um, you know, if you guys, what kind of signs or types of signs you'd look for. The overlay with the MSO went over real well with the monument based signs and and making that those uh, having to be out there with, with um, uh, you know, no backlit, uh, you know, outside illumination on it. So we're, we're just looking at first, do you guys see a need for it? Or are you happy with the signs that you have? Um, and secondly, uh, what would you like to, you know, us to move forward with uh, and just give some suggestions? Uh, if this is not something, or if you guys would like more information about you know dark skies or um, some of these other side norms and bring them forward. We could do so, but really we didn't want to overload you um, with with stuff that you might not even even want us to work on. So it was kind of hey, do you want us to work on it? Um, okay, what would you like to see? Do you want examples? Uh, you know, and that's kind of moving forward with what we were thinking. Okay, no disrespect, I'm still a little unclear what the issues might be, Mike, but would a um, would a solution be to amend or change our current ordinances to, to make them more workable rather than? I mean, I mean that is definitely a possibility. Um, it would be adding definitions in there. Um, it's, it's not necessarily uh, that yours is, is so unworkable, but it might be easier to replace it with a more modern day zoning or, or, or sign ordinance. But saying that we could definitely work through it. We're just looking for suggestions really. Um, and if you guys think there's there's a, a need for it. So, um, you know, it was something that the previous zoning administrator had said uh, they're having issues with. Um, in some areas I had seen them work through it. Uh, I had only run into one um, you know, myself at, uh, with the uh, helping him with the save a lot and the corner sign. Um, but, you know, then it became with the planning commission also, uh, hey, we really like the monument signs. Is there a way to, you know, put standards into this place where we, we eliminate a certain type or we go towards a certain type or we shrink in certain areas or other areas we enlarge? Um, and I was like, well, you know, it really should go before city council and get their approval before we spend a significant amount of time on this. Um, one thing we, we looked at was dark skies, uh, you know, cut off fixtures, 90 degrees all the way around like street lights. Um, but also you would do that with a sign ordinance that, you know, would eliminate like backlighting um, and light pollution uh, in, in certain areas or in all areas of the city. So um, while while there's no one thing, I would say there's been just a couple of instances where we have ran into it where it's been difficult. 
if you don't feel that we should look at it or you don't you know want us to relook at signs within the city we won't um we'll, we'll you know move towards something else with staff time but our issue was we didn't want to you know rent a, like put a bunch of amendments together to uh to do this and then not have the support um of city council what are your wishes council well, i think we need to bring the uh ordinances up to date Mayor, if I could, uh, Dave Bachman here. Yes. Am I on? Yes, you are. I just well, based on what he says, I'm not really sure that's the highest and best use of their time. I don't know that he defined enough of an issue for me to say, oh, we got to jump on this and put a lot of staff time into it. So without other issues or information for me, I would say I just don't see an issue that we need to spend a lot of time on. But that's where I'm at today. Anybody else? Yeah, this is uh, Martin Pontiac. Um, I agree with Dave. I don't think there's any issue right now. And I think there's other stuff that we can be focusing on. This is Mick Schmansky. Um, I, I, I don't necessarily agree that we shouldn't work on signs, but I know that Mike uh, currently is a little strapped and shorthanded. Uh, so until the the uh, planning office is is kind of back on its feet. I would say that we would certainly uh, put this on the back burner for the moment. But I do think it's something that's important. If you drive through a town, and and the signs make a difference in how you view that town. And again, when you have no real standards, it shows. Uh, so I think it's something that we do want to address. I do like the fact that you know the monument signs uh, uh, coming into town from uh, uh, the north certainly uh, are a good standard for us to look at. I don't know if it's the only way to approach it, but it certainly has made a difference there. Uh, but I think for now, there's probably uh, bigger fish to fry for the planning office. Anybody else? And this is something we can pick up at a later time, Mick. And, and um, you know, while I, I don't disagree, I think um, if we if we do work forward with it, it would be more along the lines of uh, um, we have a, a very generous sign ordinance um, when it comes to sign faces. Um, and those are appropriate in some areas, but not all areas. So, um, you know, I think if we could shrink them in some areas and expand and maybe even expand them in others it would it would be beneficial but um with if city council would like more information on it we could definitely do something on that but um if they don't uh think that we should move forward with it at this time then um, i support that as well anybody i i would actually like more information on it before i say one way or another because i don't know too much about it Anybody else? So, Mike, I think you've heard get more information. Yeah. Uh, I might suggest, and Council Way, please weigh in if you uh, if you disagree. Or I, I think if there's an area that's really giving you a lot of gas, and we can change the the ordinance a little bit to help you out, um, please bring that forward. Um, we could work on that. Does that make any sense to you, Mike? No, it makes complete sense. I think uh, with with amendment, um, you know, we're just seeing if uh, you guys would support, you know, bringing forth areas that you know we did have issues with. We haven't set any issues or any areas that we have major issues with, but it is more of like getting it in line with, um, you know, uh, with regulation as far as you know, it looks more uniform than uh, the difference or varying sizes that we have. Um, so. You know, we could bring some ideas together and, and present them, but, uh, you know, you guys, I had a feeling hadn't heard, hear, uh, heard excuse me, that uh, we were looking at the sign ordinance. And number one, I wanted to bring that to the attention that we have been. Um, and then uh, secondly, see if you guys had any suggestions, but we can definitely bring more information forward, give you guys some ideas and suggestions. And then at that time, um, maybe we should look for a, uh, you know, a concession or something. Okay. Anybody else? 
Hearing none, we'll go to the discussion on the deer call. Police uh, Chief Josh Glass. Good evening, council members. Uh, the police department was tasked with reaching out to the USDA to obtain a cost estimate to continue the deer call. Um, we've had deer calls the winter of 18 and the winter of 2020. And we finally heard back from the USDA. They advised us that to receive the same services we've had in the past, they would be charging uh, 15,500. Uh, we currently have budgeted $10,000 for this project. When speaking to them about the cost difference, their position is that they feel they have been undercharging us in years past. Um, so in order to receive the same services, meaning uh, for, for shooting events, both day and night, uh, the cost would be 15,500 for the 2021 deer call. Mr. Samansky, you, uh... Had some input on this subject uh, at the last session. Yeah, um, I really, I, you know, I recognize the fact that we are obligated almost to do a deer call in the city. Um, you know, there it's it's not a surprise to anyone that we have uh, more deer roaming around in the city now than we had. You know. 10 years ago. Um, I, I'm really concerned about the cost because I don't, you know, this is not something that we're going to do one time, two times, or three times. This is something we have to look at doing periodically. And I do know that other cities have, you know, worked other ways of doing this. I think Midland, for example, and I don't know, Chief Glass, if, if you've talked to any of your other uh, police officers about how they've managed the deer call. But I believe Midland had a pretty good plan from what I understand on managing the deer call uh, with licensed hunters. We haven't reached out to other departments for this year. Um, that's certainly something we can explore and report back to council. I know we have explored options in years past, dating back to 2009, I think the whole deer call conversation began and uh, a number of uh, conversations were had and options were explored. But in terms of Midland, that's something I can explore and report back if, if council deems necessary. You know, I, I just can't can't believe that we're we're the only city in Michigan that has these problems and that there must be some less costly ways of dealing with it than than going with uh, USDA. But that said, I don't know that we have much choice if we're going to continue with the deer call this year, other than to go with USDA, even though they've increased their their costs by, you know, from ten thousand to fifteen thousand five hundred dollars. Any other comments? Okay, sure, what's, the, what's the reasoning for their their price increase? Like besides they didn't charge us, they say they didn't charge us enough last time. Like what's the, why is it such a high increase? Councilman Sipsik, that's their position that based on their costs, their personnel costs, equipment costs, that they've actually been undercharging us in years past. That was their rationale for the cost increase. What equipment did it, I mean? So you have staffing, there's three officers involved. You have their wages, you have um, <coughs> hunting equipment, bait, housing, it's actually less expensive for them to, to, to stay the night up here or stay multiple nights. So those are the the <laughs> rationales or estimates they gave. Is processing including that too, Josh? Everything's included, yes. The processing, the packing, the inspection, the whole works. Yes, yes, sir. But Mayor, if they've if been doing it every year for ten thousand dollars, why? I, I just, I don't understand that. Why wouldn't they have said something sooner that they were not charging us enough? I, I may be able to help with that a little bit. I called Tony Adamant myself. I met him uh, back when we first started talking about Deer Call and he came to our community. They're a nonprofit. They're not doing this for profit. They're only, they're only charging us what it costs them in expenses. Um, that's, that's what he told me. 
So they're not even getting paid. It's just, they're, ex I'm just trying to figure out why, why it's so, so they're just, the $15,000 is their expenses and they're not getting paid. They, they pay their, the people who come in to do the call, they pay them. Yes. Okay. Right. Maybe we can, go ahead. Aren't the people, uh, USDA employees that are being paid through the federal government? Yes, they are, but they're not paid to do nuisance animals. They will do them, but they're, that's not part of their funding, according to Tony. Mayor, if I may, Dave Bachman here. Yes, sir. I, I have research been part of that deer call issue for many years when I was working for the city and we had um, many issues with liability related to allowing hunters or city employees to shoot deer which is why we end up with the USDA. I've been on record for probably 10 years opposed to the deer call. I'm still opposed to the deer call at any, at any cost. I don't believe we're obligated to do a deer call. Um, I don't think it works and this one I'm on record is saying I'm opposed to it at, at, any, at any level for any cost. Anybody else? Heather, this is Grabuski. Am I on? Yes, you are. Okay. Um, I've got the uh, accident uh, forms that the chief sent us since 2013. And we've had 13 accidents. 16 was 2016 was 13 accidents, 17, 15 accidents, 19 is nine accidents. I don't think that's out of uh, range. I mean, a lot of people get in accidents with deer. And that's what I covered them when I worked on the city. And it's not much out of range. I shot more when they were hanging on a fence behind somebody's house. And I just don't think that we need a deer call. I've been opposed to it, And I've had a lot of calls at home that people are really opposed to this thing. And they're opposed to paying $15,000. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, I have a comment. Um, so from what I'm hearing, there is no other option than the DNR. Um, I was opposed for the last three years of doing the deer call and I'm still opposed to it with the increase. I don't think it's needed at all. Anybody else? Go ahead, Linda. You're muted. You're Linda. muted. You're muted, Linda. Well, oh, there you go. Okay. Am I still muted? No, nope, you're good. Nope. Okay, okay. Um, the cost really does upset me, but they did say in their original documentation that we got a couple of weeks ago that they would be willing to discuss a number that we could afford. So I would be willing to maybe, I think the deer call is necessary. They really stress that we have to do this almost every year. I would like to see them at least achieve 30 deer like they did last year. Um, and I would just throw out a number that I would be willing to pay up to 12,000, but not the 15,500. That just, that's too much after last year. I, I can't, I can't see it. I, I'm having a struggle with that number. So that's my comments. Council member Beaton, if I, if I may, I could add some information. I asked him uh, what basically the city could get for $10,000. And he advised me, of course, these are estimates that they would be willing to come up here and, and essentially shoot for two days. So half the time we got before. And so I asked him, I said, uh, you know, what what typically do you see in two days? What what are your numbers that you typically call? And he estimated eight to 16 deer is usually what they call uh, within two days. Uh, last year's call, the four day period, 32 deer were called. So just to give you an idea of estimated numbers and what they propose as far as services provided for $10,000. Anybody else? Go ahead, Linda. I'm sorry. I'm pretty sure it's said in their documentation that they'd be willing to discuss a, a different number. Um, so that's why I'm thinking that I'd like to see what they could do for 12,000. Well, I, I'll tell you, when, when they did the shoot last year, I've had more people laughing at us simply because they said when after the shoot, they had 100 deer out on the golf course the next day. 
So we really didn't accomplish anything. Isn't there a time limit for this? Isn't it kind of past the time? If, if we were going to do something, we'd have to be doing it soon. Um, next, next two months. When, when I asked them if I would counsel when their ideal time frame is, they wait till after hunting season. So it would be through December. And uh, he advised usually January, February, March is what he would look at. Was there a deadline that he needed to hear, us, hear back from us? I don't believe that there is. Okay. Uh, Mr. Taylor? Yeah, it seems like there's uh, obviously differing opinions. What I would suggest is that, that we bring this back to council. We, we can't do it next week. It's a little bit late. Um, but possibly the first meeting in January and put this to a vote so um, we know what council wants staff to move forward with. Okay. That's what I was gonna suggest that we bring it up and it's too late for, for the next meeting, right? Well, I, I, can, I, can, uh, I can talk with the chief and see if uh, he's off tomorrow. I don't know um, if we'd have, he'd have enough time to turn it around and get the packet out on time. So let's just plan on the first meeting in January. Okay. Any other comments on the deer call? Hearing none. We'll go to others and Heather, could you call on the council members for me, please? Certainly. Council member Bachman. I have just a, a comment, Heather, if I would. Um, we had an event with the police this week where a barricaded government was up on a roof and they were out there all night long. And I've had this discussion with the city manager and I feel that we kind of put our police and fire chiefs at a disadvantage by not having vehicles that are equipped with emergency at home to respond and set up incident command. Um, it's an issue that, that I'm passionate about and I'm gonna hope we can discuss it between now and the budget, but I wanna lay it out there that it's an issue that when our chief has to go from his house to the station, try to find a car, then respond to have the radio and the equipment necessary to do an emergency situation, I think it puts them in disadvantage and, and puts us in a situation where we're not getting the best use out of our police chief and fire chief. So you can expect to hear more from me on that later at another date. Thank you. Council member Beaton. Uh, yes. Um, my problem is um, trying to do a, a comparison between the original senior housing de development that was proposed on the north side by Saint, around St. Saint Mary's Church uh, and compare that to what was presented to us last week with, over on Water Street. It seems to me and I would have to go back myself and try to figure this out, but I thought maybe city staff could give us a hand. I would like to see a comparison between the numbers as far as the income levels and, and what they anticipated, because it does appear to me from what I've looked at the numbers that um, they were looking at a higher income levels than what they are looking at over on Water Street. So at that point, if that were to be true, I just follow my thinking is, is that I'm not completely convinced that there's going to be a lot of people there that are going to want to sell their houses or if, they, if they're not currently renting already and move into the Water Street development. So I'd like to see a little bit more thorough analysis on that. I'm just not sure that the same people would want to move to like a five-store building or a four-store building. Um, and I do, again, I will reiterate this until we put it to a more of a vote. It is my contention that the right thing to put in that, that housing development would be workforce, how workforce people, obviously we're gonna need them. Um, they can go to school, they can walk to either end of first street and get a job hopefully at, at one of the hotels. So I just think that's a better mix. That's it for me. Okay, Council Member Beaton, um, I do have a, uh, a virtual meeting with that development group on Thursday, and I'll ask those questions. Thank you. Council Member Sipsick. Um, I'm just uh, wondering where we're at on uh, revamping the blight ordinance. 
council member Sipsik, I've met with the city attorney and we're kind of going through the ordinance and and what needs to be changed and what obstacles need to be removed so we can be a little more efficient in that. So we've started that conversation and started that ball rolling. Okay. Uh, I thought that uh, Chief uh, Ozo went over that old ordinance and changed it. He put the uh, he put together a draft uh, that wasn't adopted, um, but I will reference that draft that the ad hoc committee worked with him on uh, to steal basically some language from that. Again, the revamping uh, right now is, from my perspective, to remove obstacles so the officers can kind of be more efficient at enforcing blight, cutting right. out the steps. But I certainly plan on uh, referencing that document that the ad hoc committee put in uh, together last year. Good. I got one more question for uh, for Thad. Um, can we get some kind of um, printout from the people that are doing the rental inspections on which ones are coming up for renewal so we can compare that to like the blight report? I'm, I'm not certain I understand what you're looking for. Well, because they renew the, the certificates every couple of years. It's on like a three-year cycle. Yeah, so yeah. I think that the, the rental inspectors need to coincide with the officers. So the officers are not put on doing double the duty because these rentals are getting bypassed and getting a certificate for the next three years and they don't pass the the blight i mean the houses are some of them should be condemned and they're getting a certificate and then we're turning around and having the chief send officers out there to blight them when they been we lost you jeremy the main That's we lost I'm still here. Yeah, we, we just, may have lost her, but she's right on point. I think her point is is well said and, and important. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear yeah. me now? Yes. I think you guys just don't want me to complain about blight, so no. I'm just automatically <laughs> no, go ahead. muted every time I say the word. So what I'm just trying to say is that we need to get on this rental company to flag the blight, so. Chief Glass and his officers are not doing the same exact thing that the rental company should already be doing. Because I can tell you, I'm, I'm so passionate about this. I go into these houses on a daily basis and how they pass the rental inspection, I, I obviously am blind because I'm not, they're not seeing, you know, it's, some of them should not be have anybody in them, they should be condemned. So I think that they need to step up, give us a list of what they are going to inspect this upcoming year or month or whenever they do it. So it meets our blight criteria. If it does, they get flagged, they don't get their certificate. And then the officers aren't doing double the work. Like why we shouldn't have to put all of this on them to blight everything. Um, well, I think if the chief gets that uh, changed around that ordinance, maybe you have something, uh, Jermaine. Yeah, and Council Member Sipsik, remember that we do have safe built that will be at our January work session to talk about the rental inspection program and how it operates. And that might be a, the uh, appropriate time to start that discussion. Oh, you know, I will. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Councilmember Grabowski. <laughs> okay, uh, I want to thank Josh and all the guys that worked over at the getting that gentleman off the top of the store. I know it took a long time for you guys to get it all done, and at least somebody came out safe with nobody hurt. Um, I'm glad all the leaves are picked up. We got all that done, so I'm happy for that. So thank you, Councilmember Martin Pontiac. Yeah, I have a question for Jeff McCoola. Um, just an update on the sewer project. 
So <clears throat> two parts to that. Um, I believe they've got less than 10 pipelines left to line and they're uh, actively doing that each day. Uh, US 31, they are projecting by the time they get the failed liner removed and install the new one, it will be about December 18th. So um, the city engineer reported today that, um, that the project manager from IPR, which is the company that's doing the work, uh, they had uh, well over a dozen of their staff members off uh, due to COVID. And a lot of those, uh, most of those uh, workers have recovered and are coming back to work. So um, we're, we're hoping that, that at this point they stay on track and we can get this done in the next week or so. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mayor Pro Tem Schmansky. Um, just a couple of things. One, I, I do like uh, Council Member Sipsik's uh, uh, suggestion that uh, we somehow flag a blighted property and make sure that our inspectors know uh, where those properties are so that they can take a stronger uh, look at those properties before they uh, uh, give them a uh, follow-on certificate. Um, also, again, uh, well done with, uh, with the, uh, the work with the, the police department. Uh, it's always good when you're able to talk somebody down without uh, uh, anyone being harmed. Um, and then, you know, just a couple of things, you know, again, we're, you know, extending our stay home order. So just recommend people to stay safe, uh, you know, wear your masks, uh, take out whenever possible, you know, support our local restaurants uh, so that they can, uh, you know, help them survive as well as our local businesses. And then if I don't see you before, Merry Christmas. Mayor Zelensky. Thank you. Mr. Bachman, are you out there? Yes, sir. I didn't I mean, hear, for some reason, I didn't hear all your statement about, are you <clears throat> advocating take home vehicles for the police officers? I believe that the police chief and the fire chiefs have a car allowance and a vehicle that they can drive. They had lights and lights and radios in them so they can respond to a scene and set up incident command rather than fire chief going to the fire department, picking up a fire truck and responding as a firefighter, not as a command officer, and the fire <clears throat> police chief having to go to the fire police department and pick up a patrol car and then respond. I think it makes them much more inefficient. It eliminates a lot of um, their ability to be in command. Um, that's just speaking from experience. Uh, if you can arrive early, say for instance, um, the situation with the guy on the roof. So if Josh Glass can arrive in his own car with a radio, set up instant command there, he can make a lot of decisions in the first 10 minutes when it's critical, rather than have to go to the police department, find a car, take his stuff and get in a car and go to the scene. Same as the fire chief. You respond to a, to a, to a um, fire in the middle of the night. If you can leave your house in your vehicle, respond, set up incident command, do a scene size up and direct resources inbound, you're so much farther ahead of the curve than you are if you have to go to the um, station, pick up a truck. I know other people, particularly our DPW director has a, has a um, emergency vehicle he takes home. Um, it's just an issue I'm passionate about. I've let the city manager know, so I'm not blindsiding anybody here. I was hoping we could work out in the next budget cycle, but um, an issue I'm passionate about, and you'll probably hear from me more again if we don't work on it. Well, I agree with you. And in fact, I'd even extend that to um, if we had vehicles setting at the department, if they could be somebody's <clears throat> house in the city to respond directly from their home, it would you know, it would speed things up sometimes. Um, we allow, in my, my past, experience with the police department in Clare, we actually allowed some of our vehicles to go um, home with people so that the response was quicker. Anyway, I was just curious. Um, Mayor, when I was when I was doing it, I was in my own car. So when I was driving to the grocery store, I had a radio on. But I took my kids to school, I had the radio on. If I went to Lansing, I had the radio on. So just for me, it was a very strong command experience that I could do things in a lot of places. So thank you very much for your thoughts. I'm uh, with that. COVID's on the increase. Please, everybody, be careful. Um, it, it surely is a, a different time. 
Um, Mr. Taylor, do you have anything you'd like to add? Nothing. With that, I'll adjourn. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Have a great evening.